everyone, you know the drill, it's Jack. Um, this is a wrestling channel, we talk about wrestling. I'm not gonna waste too much time with an intro because I'm so excited to talk about what I've just found. Yes, yeah, so I was browsing the wonderful resource known as cagematch.net, looking at Stephanie McMahon's history of matches, as you do. And there was one match that really caught my attention because it turns out that she has faced A-Train in the past. You know A-Train, AKA Albert, AKA Matt Bloom. Yeah, Steph versus him. I was I was blown away. I couldn't remember it at all. So I decided to log on to the old WWE network and find out what the hell had gone on. And what I found was a random episode of SmackDown where the match did indeed take place. And it really stood out for two reasons. Number one, as I say, I had no memory of this match ever happening. I, I have vague memories of Albert or A-Train being a heel aligned with Vince McMahon when Stephanie was the babyface SmackDown GM. I remember that, kind of, but I don't remember a match having actually ever taken place between the two. And the second reason it stood out so much is because it's Stephanie McMahon versus A-Train. I had to know who won. I, I had to know who came out on top in this titanic clash. Um, so yeah, I went on the network and what I found was just just an insane episode of SmackDown. Like you watching this right now, you may well remember Stephanie versus A-Train happening. You might remember that match way more than I did. But did you know just how bizarre, not only that match, but this entire SmackDown episode was? It's almost like a bizarre time capsule of 2003. And my God, what a weird time for wrestling 2003 was. So let's take a journey back and let's relive that episode in what I believe is one of the weirdest SmackDown episodes ever, yeah, ever, of all time. So let's go all the way back to August 14th, 2003 in St. Louis, Missouri uh, for this episode of SmackDown. The first thing I noticed was we had that old theme tune, my rhymes, my hustle, blood and sweat and my blood too. I've mentioned blood one too many times there. I want it all, excess, the sex, and what's up next? And so, uh, yeah, we're welcome to the show by Michael Cole and Taz on commentary. We're 10 days out from SummerSlam 2003, just to set the scene. And who should open the show? But my word, it's Vince McMahon himself, and he's really, really pleased about something. So I did a little bit of research to work out the background to what he's saying. He cuts a promo saying, yes, Brock Lesnar is on my side, damn it. And uh, I went and looked, and basically, what had happened recently was that Vince had convinced Brock to do a bit of an impact style swerve, a little bit of a switcheroo involving Kurt Angle. Basically, Vince had tricked Brock Lesnar into having a cage match against him, Vince McMahon, with Kurt Angle as special guest referee, but it was all a ruse, they locked the door, and they both beat up Kurt Angle, the champion at the time, I might add. But I, I shouldn't have done that research, because what happens is Vince shows the whole thing on the Titan Tron, but rather than that playing out in sort of a dramatic, high package kind of way, as we'd see these days, uh, which is one of WWE's kind of few strengths these days, is the quality of their video packages. Instead, Vince kind of awkwardly commentates over the top of the action, like really awkwardly. It's very uncomfortable to watch. He's there going like, and look, Kurt Angle had no idea. Ha 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 ha. That drags on for ages, and finally, Vince brings out a very young Brock Lesnar. Look at him there, look how young he is. Also in the crowd, we'll see that people have already prepared posters about this alliance between Brock and Vince. My favorite's this one, Satan's Little Helper. We are months removed from Christmas, come on now, sir. And in something that I wasn't really used to again until this very year, 2022, as we record this video, uh, Brock Lesnar gets on the mic and cuts a promo of his own. There's no Paul Heyman to help him, but it doesn't really fit Brock Lesnar. He's kind of saying, yeah, Yes, I fooled all of you people. I am so smart. Me and Vince, we're buddies, and none of you saw it coming. That's right, the cerebral assassin, the game. Now, any good heel promo needs a heroic babyface introduction, and there's no babyface more heroic to interrupt this promo than the SmackDown GM herself, the woman of the hour. You've seen the thumbnail of this video. You've seen my intro. It's Stephanie McMahon, and she comes down all heroic and babyface. Weird. And commentary put over the fact that the GM is back. We haven't seen her since Vince got A-Train to attack her at Vengeance. And I'm like, whoa, 2003 was a different time. She absolutely tears into Vince. She says, you're no good. You're really an awful dad. You've betrayed my mum, Linda, because at this time Vince was involved romantically with Sable. Yeah, that, the, well, that certainly happened. Vince has a zinger of a comeback in 2003. He says he doesn't tolerate that kind of talk from anybody. No man alive much less a woman. Oh, 
Oh no. She draws back to slap Vince. Brock Lesnar catches the arm and Vince is outraged. He says, oh, you want to get physical and you want to talk about physical abuse like how I sent A-Train after you? And then in the line of the century, he says, I'll show you physical abuse. Whew. And he books the main event of the show, which as we know, is Stephanie versus A-Train. Just one more. F and we're straight into the first match of the night. The world's greatest tag team, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas. That's what they called themselves at the time. That's not, I was more of an Edge and Christian kind of guy in the early to mid 2000s. But it's, it's those boys against Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman. I wonder who's taking the fall here. But actually, upon watching this match unfold, I realized oh, I shouldn't have been so cynical. This is a very, very good match. It's kind of like an older relative of the more modern day NXT TakeOver wild opening tag match format. Just on a random episode of SmackDown, there's so much going on. There's big moves left, right, and center. There's hot tags. The heel team are using really good strategy and cutting off the ring. It's everything you want in a classic heel versus face tag team match. I was genuinely really impressed. It's not quite as slick or as complex as more modern day stuff or the NXT stuff you'd see between like 2016 and 2018, 19, but it is in the same region. It's in the same ballpark until... Yeah, this one has a very disappointing ending. It's all going well for the babyface team. Billy Kidman's up top for the shooting star press. He nails it as well, makes the cover, but the referee's looking at Ray for no reason. Like, yes, Ray's in the ring and he's the illegal man and he's brawling, but, you know, the referee has to fully turn his back on the action. They didn't really work this one out, I'm afraid. The ref doesn't do a very good job either. Like, he sees the pinfall being made, but for whatever reason, he waits for Ray to hit the 619 until he starts making the cover, and then it's a kick out at two. The world's greatest tag team go on to win, pinning Billy Kidman as I predicted, but that's pretty much the only predictable thing about this match. This was way above my expectations. At this point you might be thinking, Jack, this isn't that weird an episode of Smackdown yet. Okay, we're gonna crank up the weirdness a tad, because next up, we have the Bashams and Shaniqua and they lick her abs, don't they? That's what they do. They get right in there and lick those abs. Um, mmm... It's not a tag team match though. Danny Basham is in singles action and he's taking on, oh yes, yes. When this theme music hit, I was like, this is the best episode ever. He's a ass man. It's Billy Gunn, the one Billy Gunn, the ass man Billy Gunn and his girlfriend, Tori Wilson. Um, okay. Bearing in mind, we've literally just seen the segment before, a Billy Kidman match, where during his entrance, they referred to Billy having just come back off his honeymoon. They didn't mention who the honeymoon was with. It was with Tori Wilson but she's with Billy Gunn in storyline. Now, I thought Billy had this match in the bag, I'll be honest with you, because we're in 2003, still kind of the early 2000s. WWE had a weird obsession around the time with pushing Billy as this hot, young single star. Even though he'd been around for years before that and we all knew who Billy Gunn was, they were like, guys, it's this hot new, you'll never believe, it's Billy Gunn, here he comes. He's got a hot young girlfriend because he's a cool guy, just like you and me, cheer for him now. I don't want to be rude or mean. I really like, uh, I think Billy Gunn's great. He's the scariest wrestler I've ever seen in person. He's a giant of a man, a stone golem of a man. And I would never say this to his face because I'm a coward, but the age difference is clear between him and Tori. Like, look at them coming down the ramp. Ooh, it's a bit awkward. So the match goes ahead as expected until the end when Billy Gunn loses, Danny Basham beats Billy Gunn. It's not clean, but I was surprised enough anyway. What happens is Shaniqua pushes Tori into the ring. This distracts the referee and allows both Bashams to hit their double team finisher on Billy Gunn, the generic bomb, and then Danny covers him for the win. Yeah, that's quite an upset. That is quite an upset. Not the biggest of the night, not by a long shot. The heels beat down the baby faces until Jamie Noble and Nidia run out to make the save because it's 2003. But then they get beaten down as well and the heels are all happy and mm, quite a heel heavy episode of Smackdown this one as we'll come to see. Backstage we go for a quick segment involving lovable baby faces, the APA. Um, Bradshaw is one of the APA. I don't know if they're that lovable. Anyway, they're doing their homework very sensibly on the Bashams, a rival tag team, but JBL's not taking it seriously. He says to Farouk, I don't think Shaniqua is a woman at all. I think she's a man in drag. In fact, I think she's Shelton Benjamin. <gasps> Jesus. Whoa. Moving really swiftly on from that segment, we have Big Show versus Undertaker, just in the middle of a SmackDown, two titans of the business, not just physically, but metaphorically as well. Two all-time greats. They have a really slow, really slow match. But it gives me time to ponder the great mysteries in life, like how can Undertaker go on to claim that he's the best pure striker in WWE when Big Show's finisher used to literally be a one-hit KO? 
I don't know, Mark, you tell me. This match is dragging by this point. They, they brawl into the crowd slowly and they brawl deeper into the crowd, very slowly. They brawl all the way back to the guardrail slowly again, but then bang, it's action time because Undertaker is jumped from behind by the Woody Woodpecker of this episode, I'm gonna say. It's A-Train who smashes a two by four over his back. We don't see enough two by fours in wrestling these days. That's just my opinion, but I want them back. After this attack, Undertaker cannot make it back to the ring in time. Big Show can, and he wins by countout. That's two massive upsets on the show, I reckon. Undertaker losing to Big Show, that's a pretty big upset. Danny Basham beating Billy Gunn, my word. Is it just me, guys, or is it getting hot in here because it's time for some Latino heat? That's right, it's US champion Eddie Guerrero making his entrance next in that classic vehicle, the Eddie Guerrero Lowride. Oh! A pickup truck. He is on guest commentary for the next match, but uh oh, so is the man he's feuding with. So that's gonna make things awkward. It's the Rabbit Wolverine Chris Benoit. I now feel awkward presenting this video to you. That match in question that they are both commentating on is Rhino versus Tajiri, about a two minute match, which Tajiri wins by removing the middle turnbuckle pad and stepping aside as Rhino charges past and gores it. That is such a video game boss battle tactic from Tajiri there, and I admire it. I think that's another upset. Let's chalk that one up as another upset because because I wasn't expecting Tajiri to win here, certainly not without using Mist at the very least. Next up, we get the most modern day era segment of this entire show, and that's not a compliment. It's one of those ones where they've had a shell of an idea and they've written it down, but they've not really thought about how it's gonna come across when it's presented on screen. That's exactly what happened in this case. It was really awkward. So what happens is, right, Eddie Guerrero's leaving. He's like, right, I'm off. I'm scared of Chris Benoit. I'm going to the back, but Chris Benoit follows him and Eddie gets in his pickup truck and Benoit's like, give me a ride, Eddie, for old time's sake. <laughs> With radicals and Eddie for some reason Eddie's like yeah go on then once they're in the truck Benoit then goes like come on Eddie do that Eddie Guerrero thing show me some Latino heat make the hydraulics bounce on the car bro and Eddie's like no no one tells me what to do and he gets really angry for some reason and then he just storms out of the truck and he says right no one tells me what to do essay and he heads to the back and that's the end of the segment. And commentary are like, ooh, did Benoit get in Eddie's head there? And I'm like, what, what earth was that about? Next up, another handy reminder that we're in 2003. Zach Gowan makes his entrance for his match, which is up next. Who's his opponent? Is it someone near the bottom of the card like Nunzio or Crash Holly? No, not quite. From West Newbury, Massachusetts. It's John Cena. But this is heel John Cena, of course, the doctor of thugonomics. So before the match can progress, he has to spit some bars first. Those bars include punchlines like, the only offense you've got is a plastic leg drop, and whether you like it or not, you're feeling hip hop. Oh, it's distasteful. First of all, I spin more rhymes than a lazy Susan, and I'm innocent until my guilt is proven. Peace. He also says, you're only good for being two things, and one of them is a waste of space. What a setup line that is. Then the punchline comes in, and it's like, the other is being the perfect partner in a three-legged race. <laughs> <laughs> he also ends by, I can't quite remember the rhyme itself, but he implies that he's only got one leg too, and he just puts a shoe on the end of his genitals, and then that is the other leg. John Cena here, let's be very clear, is implying that for all these years that we've watched him since, his left leg, I believe, is just a permanently hard, you know, male private part, just sticking out there, clomping about on the canvas, clompy, clompy, clomp. What are you talking about, John? The match progresses. All I can concentrate on is just Cena's left leg just clomping about on the ring. Um, he calls for the FU. He shouts for it, in fact, like a Digimon, which gives Zach Gowen enough warning to avoid it, but then he falls victim to it shortly afterwards. John Cena wins, no upset this time. Um, he's got a cock for a leg. Backstage we go again. Stephanie McMahon warming up for her match. Like, that's CM Punk's warm up. What am I doing here? It's the best in the world. Stephanie McMahon, it's nearly clobber in time. She's warming up for her main event match, of course, against A-Train, but then here comes A-Train himself to like horribly flirt with her and intimidate her at the same time, which is really weird, but I guess he's the bad guy, so sort of makes sense. He grabs her hand and makes her rub his hairy, hairy chest and achieves, this is really good heel work, because he achieves something I always thought impossible. He makes me feel sympathy 
for Stephanie McMahon. Now it's time for a quick interlude in catering, where Brian Kendrick is there, or Spanky, as he was known at the time, uh, chilling with some other jobbers. He's going to try and down as much chocolate sauce as he can, while Funaki cheers him on. It's probably the most accurate representation of catering in WWE ever committed to camera. Like, you just know that this is how bored real-life lower-card superstars get in the Fed. I thought for a second I was watching Beyond the Mat or something. It seemed very true to life. But uh uh-oh, Vince McMahon's walking past, and he's got some sauce on his jacket, and he's not happy with Brian Kendrick, who he calls a stain on the underwear of life. Bit of a classic Vince line, to be fair. And these days, you know, you'd see any McMahon give almost any superstar crap, and they'd just take it and be afraid of them. But back in 2003, even Brian Kendrick, who was not high on the card at this point, even he has a little bit of bite about him back in 2003. He fires a line at Vince McMahon and mocks him for investing in the XFL. Woo! Shooting from the hip against Vince McMahon in a backstage segment. Yes! More of this, please. Or maybe less of this, because Vince gets angry and books him in a match with Brock Lesnar, so I can kind of understand why nobody goes for that these days. So the match is next. Brian Kendrick, or Spanky, versus Brock Lesnar. And Lesnar just dominates, as expected, but then he goes outside the ring, launches the timekeeper, like, into the ring steps. He kind of crumples into a heap halfway under the ring, and I'm thinking... He probably wasn't expecting to be thrown that hard, Brock, if I'm quite honest with you. Brock gets the chair, heads back into the ring, and just levels Spanky with uh, one of those sickening, sort of pre-concussion awareness chair shots. And Spanky bleeds, and it's just, it's really uncomfortable. Spanky wins by DQ. More upsets on this episode. Yay. I'm not happy about this one. Spanky continues to bleed. Brock beats him up more. Um, I'm not sure if we can show blood on this video without it getting demonetized. Basically, there's a lot of blood and Lesnar beats him up just in the middle of a a, a smackdown in 2003. Not even a pay-per-view. Blood everywhere. Beaten down a lot. Vince comes out, celebrates with Brock. It's all just an angle to get their alliance over. Um, Smackdown's fun. Yay, kids. Yay. Vince stays in the ring while Brock heads to the back and Spanky's scraped off the floor and taken to the back uh, because Vince is going to announce the special guest ring announcer for the main event. It's Sable. And now look at Vince's face when Sable walks down to the ring. Mate, come on, Vince, you dirty old man. Sable unenthusiastically announces Stephanie to the ring, but Stephanie's in babyface mode, baby. She heads to the ring. She starts beating up Sable immediately. Yes, go on, Steph. Here comes A-Train, and it's time for the big final showdown. This time, I'm gonna let it all come. Yeah, can't wait. The match begins. Stephanie slaps A-Train, and for the first time in history, somebody no-sells a Stephanie McMahon slap to the face, and he just grabs her and throws her across the ring, and she's out of it. He could win the match there and then. He looks over at Vince at ringside, who gives a big thumbs down like an evil Roman gladiator at the Colosseum, which when you think about it, is exactly what Vince McMahon is. A-Train is about to finish Stephanie off once and for all. He grabs her again, but uh uh-oh, you've done it now. You've gone and made a big mistake because here comes The Undertaker to save the woman that he tried to kidnap, marry, and sacrifice just a few short years prior. It's also one of the worst run-ins of Undertaker's career, probably, because A-Train meets him on the ramp. He, like, cuts him off. They start brawling. Big Show comes out from behind, and Big Show and A-Train just beat Undertaker down, man. For one of the most overpowered superstars in the history of wrestling, doesn't really put up much of a fight here. This was Biker Taker, I suppose, not Evil Undead Zombie Taker, but I was still a bit disappointed. Somehow the match is still going on. Uh, You'd think A-Train would have won by DQ because him and Undertaker had a fight on the ramp in the middle of his match, but no, it's still going on. And say what you want about A-Train, but he's a professional. He puts the professional in professional wrestler because he wants that fat W on his record. He wants his share of the winner's purse. So he gets back in the ring and is ready to finish off Stephanie McMahon. A-Train's finisher of choice is a Vader bomb, or did he call it the Baldo bomb, potentially? He hits his finisher on Steph, who could have been pinned anyway, but no, he wants to really put the put the shine on that, on that victory there. Hits his finisher and wins the match. No upset this time in the main event. I genuinely thought Steph was going to find some way to win, like a babyface would help her out, and it would be really funny, like, oh, A-Train lost to Stephanie. Not in the gritty realism of 2003. No. No, A-Train's just going to beat you and leave. And that's the story of how A-Train bravely beat 
Stephanie McMahon, how he overcame the odds to beat her. But it's not the end of the show yet. We need that happy image to send all the children home with a smile on their face. And that happy image comes about when Vince is walking across the ring, notices his own daughter lying prone on the canvas. And instead of helping her, you know, he's Vince McMahon, damn it. So he grabs Sable and kisses her above the twitching, semi-conscious body of his own daughter while she lies quite close to a pool of Brian Kendrick's still drying blood on the canvas. So, <laughs> SmackDown's a happy place to be. I'm guessing you all wanna know what some of these storylines went on to become or how things were resolved. So let's do, uh, just imagine like the credits rolling at the end of a teen movie when we find out what everyone went on to do after they graduated and, and we'll, we'll wrap up some of these storylines, shall we? At SummerSlam, Undertaker got revenge on A-Train and beat him at the pay-per-view. And in the aftermath of that match, Stephanie came out and beat up Sable as well. Um, so that was a happy ending, but Stephanie never avenged her loss to A-Train on this SmackDown. Maybe that's a storyline that WWE could pick up in 2022. Eddie Guerrero uh, retained the US Championship in a fatal four-way match against Benoit, Tajiri, and Rhino. So just chucking all the guys in that storyline into the same match of the pay-per-view. Lazy, but it works. I'm guessing it was a good match as well. Um, and what was the other one? Oh, Brock Lesnar. Lesnar challenged Kurt Angle for the WWE Championship. And despite being built up as this monster, with the boss's backing, he still lost because he was facing Kurt Angle. And Kurt Angle's really, really good. So, um, well done, Kurt. It's a shame that we didn't see any of him on this episode of SmackDown in the slightest, but we did see a lot of interesting stuff otherwise. So there you have it. But that was, in my mind, one of the weirdest episodes of SmackDown ever. And it's just something I stumbled across on the WWE Network, which makes me think there's got to be a treasure trove of weird old episodes out there. So I want you to please recommend any weird old episodes of Raw or SmackDown, or anything really, to react to in that comment section down below. And I will do my best to do so in the future. Also, leave a like if you've enjoyed this video and all that good stuff. I've been Jack from Cultaholic. Have a great day, and I'll see you very soon.